Hey, and thanks for joining us this afternoon for what is certain to be an invaluable discussion about triathlon training. My name is Danny Kolker, um, uh, your host, and I'm also a producer with Endurance Films. Um, so let's jump right into it. We've all heard the saying, so-and-so wrote the book on a certain subject, on this or that. Uh, well, Joe Friel literally wrote the book on triathlon training about... 15 of them, uh, actually. Uh, the Triathlete's Training Bible is the most successful triathlon training book in history. Uh, Joe has trained endurance athletes since 1980. His clients are amateur elites, professionals. They come from all over the world and include American and foreign national champions, world champion, competitors, and an Olympian. He's the author of um, many, many books, like we said, and he holds a master's degree in exercise science, and is a uh, elite level coach with USA Triathlon and USA Cycling. Uh, he's the founder um, and past chairman of the USA Triathlon National Coaching Commission. Uh, Joe conducts seminars around the world speaking to athletes and coaches um, like in this audience and provides co consultation for many, many corporations in the industry. And he's also the founder of Training Peaks and a web-based software company, uh, coaching company called Triathlon Training Bible Coaching. Um, so this web clinic is called uh, Three Keys to Your Personal Record this year. And that's pretty important because we all, as triathletes, we want immediate success. We want uh, immediate satisfaction. So if we could get a personal record this year, that would be important. Um, now. This, I should say, uh, first of all, just hi to Joe. Joe, um, we've known Joe going back to the inaugural production of Endurance Films, which was the uh, Triathlon Through the Eyes of the Elite, a documentary that uh, documented the formation of the first U.S. Olympic triathlon team for the Games in Sydney. We've known Joe since then um, and his students. Um, Joe, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Danny. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking with uh, anybody that showed up. I'll probably get a few more that come along along the way. Also, um, would you like to go ahead and start right now. Well, um, I, I, we will. I just wanted to um, let everybody know that uh, this uh, this web clinic um, is part of the Endurance Films Training Institute. It's and now you've a lot of you have been with us before. Some of you haven't, but it's uh, if you're not familiar with the Endurance Films Training Institute, USA Triathlon called it the Netflix of endurance sports. Basically, it's our industry-leading video training library, um, hundreds and hundreds of hours of top industry-leading content, all online for unlimited streaming access and a subscription model service. Um, and in a little while, I'm going to tell you about uh, some great bonuses uh, you can get if you join EFTI right now, including a couple of free books uh, from Joe himself. And I should say that joining us uh, to handle the more clinical aspects of the discussion, because I am far from a coach, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a triathlete and I am a video uh, producer, but um, to handle the more clinical aspects of the discussion with Joe, we're joined by Mark Sortino of the Multisport Performance in Institute. He's a level two triathlon coach, USA Cycling level two coach. He's a certified bike fitter, certified race director by USAT, head coach of Team USA Paratriathlon since 2012. Um, he's coached uh, national and world champion ITU paratriathletes, including Ironman and world, Ironman World Championship qualifiers. And uh, Mark is a 16-time Ironman and three-time Kona finisher and the co-founder and CEO of the Multisport Performance Institute, which coaches a diverse array of uh, people throughout the country and helps them achieve their triathlon goals. Uh, so, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Mar uh, Joe, why don't you take it, you know, it's, again, it's called, this clinic is called Three Keys to your personal record this year. Just start us off with key number one, and Mark, you can you can sort of roll with this discussion from here. Great. Just a kind of a, uh, a motto of mine, something that I use as a standard when I'm 
trying to uh, uh, write a book, for example, or an article for a magazine. I, one thing I always keep in mind, that, that motto I use is that which is measured improves. So let me say that again. That which is measured improves. If you really want anything to improve in terms of your training, um, you need to measure it. And that's really the same thing with anything in life. If you own a company and you want to, you want your company to become better producing widgets, you need to start counting how many widgets you're producing and what the cost of those widgets per unit are. Uh, if you're interested in your body weight, you need to weigh yourself occasionally. If you want your bank account to increase, you need to look at your bank account occasionally and see how much money you have in there. So we need to measure things for them to improve. Uh, almost everything we do in training can be measured in some way. In fact, there are there are only three things that we can measure in training that um, have to do with uh, with your performance. Um, we can measure, for example, the first thing is we can measure the the frequency of your training, how often you work out. Um, it's very simple to do. Uh, anybody can do it. All it takes is a calendar. You just have to look and see how many times did you work out in the past week or the past month or whatever period of time you want to look at. This is quite easy for most of us. In fact, this is in the this this one element is in the uh, the category of the novice athlete. The novice athlete needs to be very focused on frequency of training, getting out the door, doing the workouts. That's the most important thing for the for the novice athlete. That's all they've got to really be able to do is just get out the door and, and do the workouts. The other stuff is really not important because they don't get out the door, everything else is totally lost. So the issue is getting out the door for the novice athlete. Now I suspect for those of you who are tuning in today to, uh, to, this, uh, to this webinar that frequency is not an issue for you. In fact, I suspect it's usually just the opposite. Um, that's why the, the, one of the primary things coaches do, which I've done have been doing since about 1980 is trying to get serious athletes to be a little bit more conservative in how frequently they work out. They tend to push themselves way too hard and consequently the frequency of the workout is really just too great. So, so that's the first key. Not an issue for you guys I suspect unless you're a novice. Now what, what's a novice mean? I would say a novice means somebody who is in the first year of the sport. They're in their first year of triathlon. That's a novice. Some people go beyond that, and, and there are actually some people who become who move to the next stage uh, well before a year. But for the most part, roughly about a year is the novice athlete, and that athlete needs to be focused on their frequency. So I want to spend a little, a little bit of time coming back to that in just a little bit. I'll come back to the subject of frequency. But if you'd like to, Danny, I can pause right now and see if you want to do anything about the, the topic of frequency before I move on. Well, uh, you know what, Mark, I, I, I wanted to, you know, I neglected to let you get a quick hello in there after I introduced you, but I, I, maybe this is as good as time of any. Uh, again, Mark Sortino of uh, the Multisport Performance Institute. Mark, do you have anything to say about frequency? I mean, you work with so many athletes. How does that sound, what Joe just said? Well, first off, thanks for uh, having me on. It's a pleasure to be part of this with Joe. Um, I couldn't agree more. Uh, frequency is really the base of, of all of our, our, our philosophy of training, and uh, it's, it's misunderstood, and I know that Joe's going to come back to it, certainly, and my experience is, is the exact same, which is the beginner athlete doesn't quite have an understanding of that and, and may start training in somewhat of an irregular fashion where frequency is, is not part of their thinking, and the elite athlete is caught up in some progression of their evolution as more is better, and frequency becomes too much or uh, too often, and uh, they neglect to see that. And certainly, as Joe knows, he just stated, uh, for coaches and coaches listening out there, this is probably the number one um, value of having a coach for the elite athletes is knowing when uh, to take those breaks and rest and recovery. So thanks for having me. I'm glad to be aboard. Sure, yeah, Joe. Um, you know, I, I, I was hoping this is, um, you know, Mark can sort of uh, just guide us through from the coaches and athletes' perspective, um, you know, in terms of addressing anything you say that, that we might want to call special attention to. But if you're ready to, to move on, please, please do. Let us know what you're thinking. 
Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Mark, also for your comments. Um, this is this is a difficult role for Mark. He's being put in the role here of uh, commenting on things he has no idea what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, you're doing a great job so far. Uh, and and it's all stuff. This is all basic stuff. But I, I want to take it on the in the last step. I want to take it to something which is much more probably in the realm of the people who are tuning into this. Let me go to the second the second key point. The second key point I mentioned there are only three things you can measure in training. The first of which is the frequency of your training, and, and that's that's a given. How many times do you work out in a week, for example? Uh, you know, many many novices at novice athletes may be working out a total of six times a week, two times in each sport. They do two swims, two bikes, two runs. That's a novice week. Whereas a professional triathlete um, may be working out something like 18 to 20, 21 times a week. Uh, not unusual at all for an for an elite athlete to work out that many times a week. So there's a gigantic difference between the novice and the elite athlete in terms of how often they can work out. Now I suspect most of you are listening out there are neither novices nor elites who are working out that many times a week. You're probably someplace well between those two extremes of six and twenty-one. Uh, probably more in the realm of somewhere around let's say ten to fifteen workouts per week. That's probably more in the realm of most most athletes. Um, that's what they mostly do. The second, so so the, the issue for these athletes typically isn't how frequently they work out. That becomes a rather standard thing which is occasionally interrupted by lifestyle. Um, the family has something you want to participate in with your family. It's Father's Day and you, you're taking a day off because your wife and your and your uh, Kids are taking you out to breakfast, and then you're having things planned for the whole day. So there, and or you have to work overtime, and so that interrupts your training. You miss a workout here or there. There are things that come up that we all have in our lives that cause us that cause interruptions in our frequency. But for the most part, that's not an issue for the people I'm I'm talking to right now. I'm sure. The second thing on the list of the three points I want to talk with you about is duration. That's the second thing you can measure in training. Um, and duration is quite easy also. Uh, with frequency, all we need was a calendar. And calendars, by the way, have been around since something like uh, something like about um, about 7,000 years now we've had calendars. So I suspect every one of you has a calendar and you figured out that technology. It's not too hard to figure out. Uh, the second one I want to talk with you about is duration, which is how long is the workout. That's only the second thing you can measure in a, tra in a session, how long is the workout. The technology for that is easy. It takes a stopwatch. We've had watches now, clocks, since about the 14th century. I'm sure you all have a clock. You've probably got one on your wrist right now, and you know how to use that technology. It's not difficult at all. Um, and all we do is we talk about how long was the workout. And usually we talk about in terms of minutes or hours. Sometimes we talk about duration in terms of distance, which is really the same sort of thing. Uh, we still we talk about miles or kilometers or meters. Uh, we talk about these categories of things all fall into the second uh, area I want to talk with you about, which is duration. Now, um, when, you, when you take those two concepts, frequency and duration, and we multiply one by the other, frequency times duration gives us something called volume. Volume is what most athletes tend to think in terms of. Uh, when you ask an athlete, how is their training going? What they'll typically tell you is how many hours they did last week or how many miles and kilometers they swam, bike, and run, ran last week, and, and that's a volume number. They're telling you, for example, if you, if you rode your bike five times last week for an hour each time, your volume was five hours. You did five hours of training on your bike, and perhaps you swam for two hours and you ran for three hours last week. So you've got a grand total of something like about... Uh, 10 hours of training that you did last week. So you're talking about volume. You could have very easily just as well told me the durations of each of those. You, how many miles or kilometers you ran, swam, bike, and ran uh, last week. And that would be in the same category. Now, this, by the way, is really the realm of the intermediate athlete. The athlete who is beyond the novice stage, um, this is what they need to be focused on. They've already got the frequency figured out. Now they start to be concerned with how long are their workouts and how much volume are they doing in a given period of time, like a week. 
and that becomes the realm of those athletes. So, so what is an intermediate athlete? Well, let's say, just for the sake of argument, is somebody who is in the second and third year of training for triathlon. So they're essentially working on um, improving their duration, their ability to handle greater volume in their training. Um, now, um, that's the second thing. So I'm going to pause here before I go into the last one and see if uh, Mark wants to comment on anything I may have br brought up here. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Danny. Yeah, um, yeah Mark, why don't, why don't you just pick it up? I guess what, what I would be interested in is to know uh, if, you know, you said that the, the second year athlete might be focused on more du duration. How, how hard and fast are those rules, or, or is that model? And uh, Mark, do you... What have you found uh, in working with your athletes um, pertaining to what Joe was just talking about? Well, I think that's a great way of explaining it, and uh, I, I, I really like that. It, it's, it, it's exactly what occurs, and what I'm sure Joe's going to address further down the road is this combination of getting to volume. Is it frequency, and you take uh, duration down? Do you increase frequency? In other words... If I'm going to run a volume of 20 miles a week, do I do a lower frequency of twice and the duration for each is 10 miles? Or do I run five times, uh, increasing the frequency and reducing the duration to, to four miles per run? And that's really where you start changing from beginner and even intermediate. And I think for the typical athlete who's got a year under their belt, they want to start progressing to a longer uh, distance, whether it be from sprint to Olympic, Olympic to half, uh, or, or all the way to a full. Uh, I do think that this is a big unknown. Do I increase duration, and how long, and how, how, how much do I increase this duration? And do I keep the frequency at the same? And how do I mix this up so that I still can progress? in this uh, periodization towards the goal. Uh, so I, I think it's a great way of showing the basic formula and, and, and how you're going to work it to achieve your goals is the key. So is there anything you'd want to know from, from Joe, even maybe sort of role playing, putting on the hat of some of your, some of your athletes? Yeah, I guess the question I would have, uh, Joe, would be, you know, I'm, I'm a second-year uh, athlete. I was doing probably about uh, 10 hours a week. Uh, I want to, you know, take the next step up to a half Ironman. Um, I, I only have a certain amount of time I can train during the week, uh, but I'm able to train more on certain days. You know, how do you advise athletes between that frequency and duration uh, and overall volume? Yeah. Yeah, very good question, Mark. Um, let, let me answer it this way. There's probably several ways to answer that question. Uh, it, gets, it gets at the heart of what the, the, the intermediate athlete especially is concerned about, which is how do I, how do I progress at this point? And, and I would say the way you do that is you, okay, let's, let's take your example. The athlete is turning for a, for a 70.3, a half Ironman. And uh, so the question becomes, how should I train? How much volume should I do? Uh, in each of the three sports to prepare for this half Ironman. The starting point for the answer to that question, I believe, is to take a look at what you anticipate the amount of time you're going to spend in the entire race and then per event within the sport, within the race, right? So how much time are you going to swim in the race? How much time are you going to spend on the bike? And how much time are you going to run? And those make up um, roughly the ratios you should use in your training also. So, for example, Roughly half the race is on your bike. Now, some people spend less than that. Some people spend more than that. But roughly half your time is on the bike. So, therefore, roughly half your time training should be on the bike also. It, it's a big chunk of what you're, you're, what you're doing to prepare for this event. Half of the race is going to be on the bike. So, you need to make sure you're well prepared for that. Maybe something like about 30% of the race, 35%, is going to be running, and, and the remainder is going to be swimming. So we would ratio uh, use the same ratios then to kind of figure out how much time is going to be spent in each of the three sports in your training. So if you're doing a 10-hour week, we've already got roughly five hours on the bike, three hours running, and two hours swimming. 
Now, from that point, what I would have an athlete do is take a look at uh, what are your limiters, your sport limiters. Which sports are the ones or sport is the one or are the ones that are holding you back? Um, are you, for example, already a very strong cyclist? Perhaps you've been around the sport of cycling for many years, but you're relatively new to running and swimming, and those tend to be weaker sports for you. Well, I would say then let's move some of that five hours of your 10 hours total away from cycling and move it into, in, into swimming and, and running. So we'll kind of um, redistribute the time so we can work on the sports that, that need the most attention uh, right now to get ready for that, for that half Ironman. So that's kind of the way I would come up um, with a number based on how many hours the athlete has to train. So it's, a, it's an extremely uh, pertinent question you're raising because that's really at the heart of what the athlete is concerned about is how much time do I spend in each sport. So that's, that's how I would do it. So let me pause there again and uh, give Mark a chance to comment before we move on. Well, excellent. And I, uh, I again, uh, very well uh, explained. Certainly, if I'm a, in that intermediate level, that, that difficulty of going from a first year to a second year, trying to figure out is probably, you know, how much I can do, how much should I do, is exactly the key. And I uh, completely agree on that starting point. I think we have to look at the time available to train uh, overall before we look at limiters. This is where we should be training and then looking at limiters uh, and what your example is quite common where we do get a lot of uh, cyclists coming into the sport who are, who are quite strong uh, and I would add for the athletes out there that uh, one of the hardest things as coaches we find is, is encouraging athletes to work on the limiters. It's not very much fun to uh, work on a discipline that you're not maybe as adept at, as skillful at uh, when you are so good at one of the other uh, sports. So uh, take that to heart what Joe says, and I, I do think it's, an, it's a critical part of, uh, of, of progressing forward to a successful year is spending the time identifying and then uh, working on your limiters. Great. Uh, uh, we'll move on, and I'm sure we're gonna, about to move into an area Maybe I'm wrong, but Joe's talked about a couple of things uh, that we've been able to quantify. Uh, we've had the technology to quantify for a while. I suspect we're about to move into something that we, some kind of technology that's uh, a new kind of um, quantification for us. But I should let you know that we, I do see questions coming up on the chat roll that's on this event, uh, the uh, live event page. Uh, we are going to get to the questions at the end uh, once Joe's finished the presentation. So hang in there. There's some great questions posted uh, from the uh, audience. We'll, we'll get to them. But um, Joe, if you're ready to move on, let's, let's keep rolling. You bet. Thanks, Thanks Manny. Um, so review, we've got frequency we can measure, and we've got duration we can measure. Duration, and those two combined are called volume, which is everybody's aware of those three, those three things. Uh, so let's move on to the, to the last item you can measure in training. And that item is called intensity. That, that is the, the last of the three. That, it doesn't matter whether you're new to the sport or you've been around the sport for most of your life. If you're an elite or if you're a novice, you really still only have those three things you can measure. You can only measure the frequency of your training, the duration of your training, and the intensity. So let's take a look at intensity because this is the one I really want to focus on um, because I suspect most of you who are, who are tuned in today are probably beyond the third year of training for the sport of triathlon. You've been around the sport perhaps more than that. And if you had, I would call you an advanced athlete. You've been in the sport long enough, you have enough experience, that you have a good sense of what the sport demands of you and how to train for it. Intensity is the, is the key piece to this athlete. In fact, research study after research study has told us that the real determiner of performance gains for the advanced athlete is the intensity of their training. For example, I can go way back in research history and start pulling up research studies that support this, and they've been around, by the way, for something like about 30 or 40 years now, studies that, that support this idea that intensity is the key element of training. Uh, for example, uh, there's a study back in the 1980s, which has been replicated several times, by the way, that shows that um, the best indicator, the best predictor of performance in a marathon is how fast you run a 10-mile workout. 
that's a much better indicator than how many miles you ran in a week and also much better predictor than what the longest runs were. So how fast you ran 10 miles is the best predictor we've come up with way back a long time ago for what your performance is going to be in a triathlon without obviously going out and doing a triathlon. So doing something in a workout that we can measure, what would be the thing to measure? Well, this research study suggests a 10-mile run. How fast can you run a 10-mile run? That predicts your marathon time. It's intensity. That was far better than either duration or, um, or volume or, uh, or frequency of training. Uh, so that was really the key element, and, and, and again, it's intensity. Another study, going back to the 1990s from uh, David Costell, Ball State University, uh, who studies swimmers, who studied swimmers a lot, still does, by the way, to some extent. But in the 90s, they took a group of, uh, of collegiate swimmers, had them start swimming three to four hours a day. Uh, they had previously been swimming about an hour to two hours a day, had them swim three to four hours a day, and I've forgotten how many weeks it was, it was something like six, six weeks, and they found no improvement in performance compared to what they were doing when they swam one to one and a half hours per day. Their volume did not improve their performance. So again, the key element here wasn't how much frequency or duration, it was, it was obviously the intensity of their training because the intensity stayed the same throughout the various protocols, three hours versus one and a half hours in training. Um, Recently, more recently, for the last 10 years, there have been a number of studies that have looked at what's called polarized training, which has to do with talking about how much, how much training you do above your, your threshold uh, and how much training you do below your threshold. Now, threshold is, um, we can describe that in many ways, but let's say, we, let's, let's call it your anaerobic threshold. It's the, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the, the hardest effort you can do, uh, this would be like a seven effort. Um, it's also sometimes called the lactate threshold. And, and there's a number of other terms that are used to describe the phenomenon which occurs around the point where you start to redline when you begin to increase the intensity. So in, this, in the more recent studies, in the last 10 years or so, they've been looking at how much time athletes spend above that threshold, in other words, very hard training, very hard workouts, versus below that threshold, much easier workouts. And what some of the research, in fact, almost all the research has shown is that there seems to be an 80-20 ratio that is very successful for athletes. If they get about 20% of their training time above the threshold and 80% below the threshold, they tend to do better than if they get something like 90% below the threshold and 10% above, or 100% below the threshold and 0% above. So this 80-20 ratio seems to be... Um, uh, supported by, by much of the research recently and seems to indicate to us that that 20% is critical to performance. This does not mean, by the way, that the 80% is unimportant. It does not mean duration and volume are unimportant for the athlete. All it's saying is that the most important element is that is the intensity of training. Um, so so what's, what's the ratio between how, how important is the duration of your workout versus how important is the intensity of your workout? I've always used a ratio of 60-40. In other words, about 60% of your fitness on race day comes from the intensity of your training you did over the last several weeks, whereas about 40% of your, of, your, of, your, of your fitness on race day comes from the duration or volume of your training over the past several weeks. So this, and this intensity becomes more important the closer we get to the event. So early in the season, um, the standard model of periodization, the, the classic model or linear model, is that we would spend time working on volume, working on duration. That would be the 80%, if you will, of that polarized churning that I talked about in the studies. And as the season progresses, as we move closer and closer to our first event, the churning starts becoming more like the first event. So we add more intensity because intensity becomes the the key defining factor. We need to make sure we've got that nailed down before we get too involved or stay too involved in the duration as we get closer to our event. So we start working on, on, the, on the, the intensity of our training, and I would define that intensity as being something which is uh, on the par of what the intensity should be like on race day. If you intend to come off the bike in Olympic distance race and run seven minutes per mile, you need to start doing lots and lots of runs at seven minutes per mile off the bike in training the closer you get to the race. You don't need to do that 
eight months before. Eight months before, it's not quite so critical. At that point, duration and volume uh, have some impact and can have a great deal to do with your performance on race day. So we build that, that level of fitness, that base of fitness, as we all refer to it, and then we start moving into the higher intensity stuff, and we do more and more of that as we get closer to the race. So, um, so we need to make sure we're working on stuff which is high intensity relative to the event we're training for. If you're training for a half Ironman, as, as Mark suggested a little while ago, that's a different intensity. It's probably somewhere closer to doing turning around the threshold or slightly below it. But I would suggest that in your training, that year-round, you should do a little bit of high-intensity training, a little bit, year-round. I would never let it entirely go dormant. In other words, even in the base period, when we're focused on the, the volume or duration of your workouts, even at that time, I would include a little bit of high-intensity training. High-intensity meaning above the threshold, above that lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold. So I would suggest doing things such as uh, fartlek workouts early in the base period, where you just add a few minutes once a week of doing things which are higher intensity than, than, your, than what you're used to doing, that push you a little bit, but only for a very brief period of time. And let's say that means something like five minutes per sport per week done above threshold back early in the base period. So we just introduce a bit of high intensity training. It has uh, high intensity training has been shown to do miraculous things for our bodies. It it, it stimulates um, hormones and, and eventually improves because of that aerobic capacity. It improves muscular uh, strength or power that you can put out, um, which is also a very beneficial thing later in your season when you start racing. Um, it improves your economy. How how much energy it takes to move your body within your sport, swimming, biking, or running. Uh, the high intensity training also improves that. So just a little bit of that type of training done early in the season, especially like early in the base period. And then as the season progresses, we gradually can add in a little bit more and more of that high intensity training. So perhaps by the time we get into the last 10 or 12 weeks before the race, maybe now we're doing something like, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes per sport per week of high intensity training, in other words, above the lactate threshold. And I would even have athletes training for Ironman distance races who are advanced athletes, not intermediates, certainly not, not novices, but the advanced athlete, I might still have them doing that because it has such a big payoff in terms of performance in the long term. That would be blended in with lots of race intensity also throughout that period of time for the Ironman distance athlete, for example. The Ironman distance athlete is going to do workouts which are above the aerobic threshold which are relatively easy. Let's, let's say that's like zone two, perhaps zone three um, for an athlete, swimming, biking, and running. Uh, so talking about heart rate zones. So those are not really real hard zones, but throwing in just a little bit of this high intensity throughout the season with more of it occurring uh, later in the season, later meaning the last 12 weeks or so before the race we're aiming for, uh, that becomes critical, I think, to actually improving the athlete's performance because we've done it year-round. We just haven't done it for a very brief period of time, nor have we forgotten to do it. I, I, I see too many long-distance athletes, long-course triathletes, half Ironman, Ironman, who totally neglect anaerobic churning. They become very focused on aerobic churning, which is, which is good. You need lots of aerobic churning also, but you need to throw in a little bit of this high-intensity training, even for the long-course athlete. I find it provides great benefits for that athlete in many, many ways and uh, will do a lot to maintain performance. In fact, there's research studies that support that also. Um, we did a, my, Jim Vance and I did a book here a couple of years ago called Triathlon Science in which we had several authors, uh, mostly sports scientists, contribute chapters to the book. And one of them pulled up some great research which showed that there is a bigger gap between Ironman distance pros and Ironman distance age group athletes in terms of their performances per sport than there is between Olympic distance elite athletes and Olympic distance age group athletes. In other words, the, more, the, more long, the longer the course became, the greater the ratio of difference was between the elites and the age groupers. Why? Well, because when you do short distance races, you tend to do a lot more high intensity training. As we do longer course races, we tend to let the high-intensity training go to the, to, the, 
to the background. We don't do it as much. In fact, we may not do it at all. And therefore, we begin to lose our via aerobic capacities. Our lactate threshold begins to suffer, and our economy begins to suffer because of that. Whereas the pros keep on doing a lot of that stuff. They keep on doing some of this high-intensity stuff year-round. So uh, it was an interesting research study, which, which uh, one of the, again, one of the authors in, in our book brought to the, to the, to the forefront. Uh, but it shows that there's, a, there's probably a need for the high, for the long course athletes to do high intensity training even, uh, even throughout the season. So, again, I will stop there, Mark, and let you uh, comment on anything you want to at that point. Uh, thanks, Joe. <clears throat> you know, I think the, the big things that stand out are, uh, and you essentially refer to some form of periodization throughout the year for an athlete. And... Uh, certainly, if you have a brand new athlete, uh, if you're a new athlete, uh, you know your intensity and the number of intensity uh, and types of intensities that you're putting in your your training are going to be quite different than than an experienced athlete. Um, I do think that a couple things that athletes need to remember is this idea that 10, 12 week, whatever you somewhere in that realm, Joe starts talking about race specificity. So in other words, we have a race that may be in October. We're not training for that specific race uh, in January, the year, you know, that January at the beginning of the year. We're actually working on that, the other part of our training, the base with intensity. And in fact, we build uh, throughout the year. And once we get in this window, uh, wherever it may be, depending on the athlete and the goals and the time, we start training more with race specificity in mind. And Joe, I will I will add 100% that change in our training, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, is essential. We need to induce change, and the intensity is one of the ways you can do that. That that is a big, big part of improvement. And after you take off at the end of a season sort of an un, unstructured break in your training, whether that's a couple weeks, a month, uh, through the holidays, when you start back up as sort of this intermediate and advanced athlete, uh, you should be putting in um, this type of intensity, uh, certainly different than six months from that point uh, when you get closer to the race, but you really should put that into your training. Uh, I will also say that I firmly believe in, in you know, continuing to swim. It's one of those that, uh, you know, it, sometimes, and we'll use, and Joe, you can comment on this, but in, in sort of this early part of the season, it's a great opportunity for us uh, instead of, uh, quote, unquote, aerobic or base training and swimming, we do a lot of skill work. However, we're still almost always putting in intensity uh, into our swimming weekly throughout the year. Um, and certainly as we get closer to the race, we start, we start adjusting that swimming based on that. And I think what Joe said is exactly right, that we have to always think about, we, we shouldn't be afraid of it. So for those of you out there that are long course athletes, and you're like, well, I just need to keep being able to ride these 90, 100, 110 mile rides every weekend. Uh, I enjoy it. Um, boy, I'm glad I'm not racing Olympic distance races or sprints anymore. They're too hard. I don't like... Uh, the effort level, I don't feel good. Well, I'm, I would encourage you to take what Joe's saying to heart because that's how, uh, you know, both of us train athletes and especially elite athletes year-round is because of that intensity. Well, let me ask you guys something. And Joe, uh, you know, as a, as a age group triathlete, you know, that word intensity is, it's sort of elusive to me because sometimes I don't quite know how intense intense is it's sort of like one of those you go to the doctor how much does this hurt on a scale of one to ten you're like well it's you know it could be a seven could be a nine how do you how do you what's the best way to measure that intensity so you're most effective during the race yeah great question Danny um, let me let me let me do it this way let's let's say they're they're, they're actually from my way of seeing the world the world of the training there are, when we talk about intensity, there are two categories of intensity we can train, we can, we can use in training. One, I would call uh, effort. Um, so you, you mentioned like on a scale of 1 to 10 at your doctor's office, we can use a scale of 1 to 10 um, when you're riding your bike or swimming or, or running. Uh, how hard is this workout on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the hardest possible and 1 being very easy? 
So that, that's fairly common. That's an effort measure of intensity. Um, whereas a counterbalancing measure of performance, which is the other category, is speed. How fast are you running? How fast are you swimming? How fast are you biking? These are performance measures. Um, another, another effort category, by the way, which probably a lot of you will like to argue about with me, is heart rate. Heart rate is not a measure of performance, it's a measure of effort. Um, I've never been to a race yet where they said, who had the highest heart rate today? Okay, you get first place. Who had the second highest heart rate? You know, there's, the person who comes across the finish line first and the person who comes across the finish line last can have exactly the same average heart rate. Um, there's no reason why they can't whatsoever. So consequently, it's not a measure of performance, it's a measure of effort. It, it, when you look at your heart rate, it's telling you how hard are you trying. That's what it's telling you. It's not telling you what your performance is. It doesn't tell you anything at all about the outcome of the, the workout or the race. It only tells you how hard you're working right now. Uh, but if you go back to the other category again, the intensity category, um, another measure there that athletes could use besides speed would be power on the bicycle. Uh, that's a measure of performance. Um, the person who comes across the finish line first in a time trial will more than likely have the highest power output of the race. Uh, more than likely, depends on how many hills there are and what they weigh and all that kind of stuff. But more than likely, that's going to be what we'll find on the flat course especially, and which is most commonly what we see in sports like triathlon or time trialing, is the, the athlete will have the highest power, will have the, high, the best performance. They'll come across the line first. Especially if we're talking about watts per kilogram, in other words, power relative to, relative to body weight, we will see the same thing. So power is a measure of performance. It's not a measure of effort. It's a measure of performance. Having both of those categories all the time is very beneficial. So if you can measure, for example, heart rate or rate of perceived exertion, 1 to 10, and at the same time you can measure your speed or your pace, like swimming or, or running, or you can measure your power on the bike, you have now got some great tools. You've got two categories, and it, it occurred to me something like about 12 years ago that when you know those two things, that when you know, when you know effort and performance, what you really know are in, in the bigger realm of the world, what we really know are output and input, and if you divide output by input, you have something called efficiency. Efficiency is a great marker for how you're doing as an athlete. So let's say that we could measure that, which you can. All you'd have to do is, is for example, go for a run. Uh, you do a hard run. You warm up. You do a hard effort. Let's say it's a, a 5K race. You do a hard effort, 5K race. And when you get all done, you've got your average speed for the race. Don't use your pace, by the way. Pace is hard to work with. You, you can figure out your average speed for the race. And, you can, and you've got your average heart rate right there on your wrist, if you divide average speed by heart rate, you've got efficiency. And if you know that number, you can now compare that number with, with your other 5K races. How, did you, how do your other 5K races go? Are you becoming more efficient? In other words, the bottom line is we're measuring fitness, aerobic fitness when we do that. Efficiency for the endurance athlete is aerobic fitness. So we've just measured your aerobic fitness in run, when running a 5K. Output divided by input. Effort divided by performance. So I would suggest you have both realms covered. You have a heart rate monitor or you use an RPE. Heart rate monitor is much more subjective, or per, I'm sorry, objective, whereas RPE is much more subjective. So your heart rate monitor is probably a better device in this case. And I would suggest you also need a GPS device or run a lot on measured courses. Um, or, and also it would be very valuable if you had a power meter for your bike. Now we're starting to talk about money, I realize, because we're no longer in the realm of things that have been around for four or 5,000 years, uh, calendars and, and clocks. We're now talking about something which is relatively new, it, the, 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 um, the, uh, uh, the technology is new, and it's rather expensive, but the price is coming down. For example, on power meters, uh, they're down to like $800 right now for a power meter, and I expect to see that price cut in half in another year or so, there'll be half of that price, and eventually there'll be a, a half of that price. It'll be down to $200, not too far off the price of a heart rate monitor, and the information you get is, is huge in terms of measuring how you're doing as an athlete, especially the intensity of training, which is critical to your performance as an advanced athlete.
So again, I'm going to stop right there, Mark, and uh, let you comment if you'd like to on anything. Well, well let me let me jump in here, Joe, because uh, what you were just talking about is uh, it it's really close to my heart as simply a producer of the content that uh, with which uh, we work with you, because we have some great uh, some you you every every two years USA Triathlon has the Art and Science of Triathlon Symposium. Uh, it's really an elite gathering of mostly coaches who go to this, and, and Joe is usually a presenter at it and does these fascinating uh, uh, presentations. Um, usually, I think the ones that we have have to do something with either power, training with power or training stress. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, let's. I sort of want to wrap this discussion up. Um, I know, Joe, we could talk to you for, forever uh, and Joe and Mark, uh, but w what I want to do is sort of wrap this this up. Uh, you know, the, the subject of this this clinic is three keys to PR this year. So we've talked about we've talked about the three keys, but also I think there's an over overall uh, subject, which is uh, sort of, and we've talked about this with you, Joe, is having a continuing education in triathlon and doing what everybody who is sitting here listening to you talk right now is doing. They're interested in having a continuing education. We're presenting this video content um, and that's really that's really our mission. I mean talk about the importance of people being able to just sit down and hear things like this for their to, to be able to set a personal record. Either one of you can talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll just kick in a little bit and then Mark turned over to you. Um, yeah, they're, you know, um, Measured, uh, I think the bottom line of what I'm trying to say here to athletes, if you are an advanced athlete, let's again, let's say it's beyond three years' experience. You've been around the sport for at least three years. Uh, I would call you an advanced athlete. You've got good experience for the sport. The key to your performance, continuing impro improvement in your performance in races, races is the intensity of your training. And you need to make sure you're continuing to do things that, that in, in, include the entire realm of uh, the intensity spectrum from very low intensity recovery workouts to very high intensity aerobic capacity workouts and everything in between. We need to do a, a mix of all these things. The only thing we vary is how much of these things, of each of these intensities we do as we move through the, through the season, the periodization of training. And I've commented on that and so has Mark, so I'll go back in, into that again. But, but this really is the bottom line that if you really want to improve as an athlete, your focus must be on the intensity of your training. You're not going to improve by continuing to focus on the duration or the volume of your workouts. That is not going to bring you to where you want to get. You need to do things that have to do with your intensity. So I will stop there, Mark, and step aside. Uh, I echo that, and I think you made a great case for it, uh, Joe, also. And, you know, to Danny's point, you know, listening to Joe talk in this video format, um, is for many people a lot easier to digest this information than reading it on a in a document or a study. And so, you know, I find EFTI and the library of countless and countless videos and this idea that I can, you know, pull up a video and learn about, okay, I heard Joe talk about power, how great it is, I can afford a power meter, how do I get going? You know, how do I do this? Uh, you know, there's a video in the library for you. Um, there's all sorts of information. Uh, and to have well-established experts in the field talk this through, uh, either uh, personally through video or while they're presenting uh, on video, is a great, great asset to every athlete. Certainly, as a coach, uh, I will tell you that there's never enough information uh, for me. Uh, and the more I learn, uh, two things happen. Uh, the, the, the truths of life stay the same, and the, the more I realize there's more to learn. So just what Joe said, many of the things he talked about in, in today's talk have been around for a very long time, and uh, the success has been proven uh, over and over. And so I would encourage everybody, Danny, before I hand it off to you, is, is that you know, you're here, you're listening. Uh, there's a world of these, this information through video at EFTI, so I would highly encourage everybody to take advantage of that. 
Yeah, that's that's really our our mission here is to provide this content. We've been doing it for for a long time, and like I said, to really understand what Joe's talking about and to really dig into it and to make yourself the best possible athlete you can be. Um, I use the phrase continuing education, and that's 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 you can't. There's a lot of resources. Let's talk about video. There's a lot of video you could go to YouTube. But I've heard a lot of coaches. I've talked to you, Mark, about going down a, a quote-unquote YouTube rabbit hole, where you know you, it's not quite all vetted. It's not quite all quality. Um, so that's been our goal. And as we, you know, speaking specifically to uh, to to Joe, I mean, we've got we've got follow-up information that you can find uh, on the Endurance Films Training Institute, which is basically a streaming subscription service. If, if we know a lot of the people watching are probably members. If you're not, EFTI is a streaming subscription-based video service that has our entire industry-leading content library uh, under one roof. Uh, it's streaming anytime you want to any computer or mobile device, and it really is something that any, you can use as an athlete, as a coach, uh, to to help improve your your performance. And it's got not only people like Joe, but it's got uh, not only Joe himself, but it's got really the highest level coaches, sports scientists, sports psychologists. It's all in there. It's it's complete with downloadable presentations of slides that you can store di digitally, so you can review and study at any time. And you know we've talked about this. Uh, you know, think of the the value of having this information, like being able to pull up, uh, and not wait for a webcast that's scheduled a week out in advance, and you know you you have to re remember to watch it at a certain time or at least go to one link um, for a replay. But think of the value of having all this type of information at your fingertips in a Netflix style delivery system. And sure, you can find some gems out there with YouTube, but not with the efficiency and potency and exclusivity of the EFTI content, because you will not find Joe's presentations anywhere else, or that of his colleagues that joined him in the Art and Science of Triathlon Symposium, the USA Cycling Coaching Summit, and dozens of the other uh, videos that we have. And, you know, you really spend a lot of time on, and maybe you could speak to this uh, Mark or Joe, the, the the money that you that you people will spend on a new disc wheel or or some kind of gear or equipment, they're thinking, oh, that might get me a few extra minutes. The value of a of an education, um, you know, in in the sport and making and understanding what you need to know about the, the three keys to your PR: understanding power, intensity, volume. Uh, you know, you, you know how how much more valuable is that than just some some stuff. I mean, at least that's how I've always felt and have been able to, you know, execute on that feeling through my work with Endurance Films. Yeah, uh, I, I certainly agree, Danny. The, the probably the, the self-coached athlete has two options. You can learn um, by reading, uh, talking with athletes, talking with coaches, going to symposiums. Uh, using EFTI to find topics of, of interest and, and making sure you chase down all the information. That's one option. You can do all that. Um, many athletes do it. In fact, that's how I got started doing all this stuff back in the 1970s, and there, and there wasn't hardly any information available at all. But that's where I got started, was asking questions, talking to people, reading anything I could find, and trying to come up with solutions. For me, I wasn't trying to do this to write a book for some other athlete. I was doing it to try to figure out how I could become a better athlete. That was my focus. And that led me to read research, which I continue to do this to this day. Every day I start the day by reading research. It's a huge task. It's never ending, as Mark said. You never, you never can learn, know everything. There's always more stuff to be learned, and there's always stuff that's being rethought. So it's not like it's an ongoing sort of thing that never changes. It's always changing. Uh, and you have to keep up with all that. So that's one option the athlete, self-coached athlete can have. Or you can hire a coach who does all this himself or herself does all the research themselves, keeps up with all the, re the all the things that are going on in the sport as far as best practices. Uh, so you've got those two options. Um, one requires money, the other requires time. And, and always, it always comes down to those two things I've found in life. It's either money or it's time. You have to decide which thing do you have an excess amount of, and therefore you can use that to solve your whatever the dilemma or problem or 
Yeah. Well, maybe. So, yeah, I agree. That's that's exactly yeah. what it's all about, learning. Yeah, and and we we want to get to questions real quick, um, but uh, but just before we get to that, I want to tell people how they can get access to this content because once uh, just in in just a little while, you know, this uh, webcast will not be available or for public con consumption. Um, it'll be another exclusive piece of content on the Endurance Films Training Institute. Uh, basically, like we said, you're here for a reason, and that's to learn as much as possible to be a better athlete. That's what the Endurance Films Training Institute is all about. So in honor of Joe's appearance here with us, we wanted to tell you about a phenomenal offer that we have. Uh, you can get a full year uh, subscription to Endurance Films Training Institute. That's unlimited streaming access for just $297. That's, that's hundreds of hours of exclusive content that really purchased a la carte would cost thousands of dollars. And not only that, you'll get some great bonus gifts from our wonderful industry partners. And all you have to do is, is click the more information button on this page to find out. But even more special and exclusive to you, the audience of this specific uh, web clinic, everyone who gets an EFTI yearly subscription will also get a free copy of Joe's latest book, the power meter handbook and you'll really and it, it's it shows that you know using a power meter uh, in training can be daunting uh, but it's also one of the most of utmost importance to get the most out of your training and in this book Joe really makes it uh, very digestible and if you if you hurry we're going to say the first 10 yearly subscribers uh, new yearly subscribers to the Endurance Films Training Institute will also get an autographed copy of Joe's latest edition of the Triathletes Training Bible. Now that's it, it's the Bible of triathlon training books. It's 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 the granddaddy of, of them all, and it's really something that every triathlete should have on their shelf. And if you already have it on your shelf, well, you don't have a probably don't have an autograph one by by Joe. So that's just two hundred ninety seven dollars for a full year subscription to EFTI. Unlimited access to hundreds of the leading video training content and streaming anywhere to any computer or mobile device. Again, uh, all the bonus gifts from our wonderful industry partners, the Power Meter Handbook by Joe Friel, as well as, if you hurry, the first 10 people will get an autographed copy of the Triathletes Training Bible. Um, now, if you want to take it super slow, we do have a monthly subscription option for $39 a month, but I think you'll see, um, as almost everybody who's, who's joined EFTI has, that the, that the yearly subscription is a, is a much better value and offers a lot more, a lot better bonuses, including Joe's wonderful book. So, that said, um, we want to be mindful of people's time. It is the after, afternoon, so we do want to get to uh, a, few, a few questions, and I'm just going just to pull up... Um, those that I think can be answered fairly efficiently. The, the first one is just sort of a, a quantifiable question. Joe, uh, uh, one of the, the guests, Frank, wants you to clarify, did you say that 20% weekly volume should be over lactate threshold uh, uh, or in a for instance in a 10 hour week, two hours we would be greater than lactate threshold? Yeah, that's that's the research Frank is referring to called the polarized training uh, method. Uh, polarized training says that 20% of your training would be above the threshold. Now that doesn't mean in, in a given week. Um, it probably means over the course. It's an average over the course of a longer period of time. Let's say 12 weeks, something like that, or even longer, an entire season. This is the sort of thing you keep track of very easily if you have um, software for, let's say, power meter or heart rate monitor or speed and distance device, you can keep track of how much time is spent above threshold versus below threshold and stay focused on making sure you get an adequate amount of time above threshold. That seems to be, from the research right now, around 20%. So yes, to answer that question, if we're only talking about a 10-hour week and we're trying to get an 80-20 and that would be two hours of training above threshold during that two hours for the three sports, total for the three sports in terms of the triathlon. I wouldn't try to get two hours obviously in each sport, that would be six hours total time, so it's, it's divided among the three sports. Okay. Uh, we have a question from somebody who says they're a novice to the sport, uh, and that guest says, I have trouble elevating my heart rate when riding my bike. I feel that my effort is not good, but their heart rate monitor is topping out in zone two, 125 beats per minute. What do they need to do to get their heart rate up? Uh, Great question. This, this is this is brings us back to the very start of the conversation today, which is that the uh, the novice athlete in first in the first year of the sport 
your focus really should be just be on frequency. How, how often do you get out the door? I wouldn't be too concerned with your heart rate at this point. Um, but let me answer your question uh, because there will be other people interested in this whole idea of using the heart rate to, to measure intensity. Um, really comes down to what are we using as, as the mark, the, 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 the point of referral uh, for trying to figure out our zones. There, there are two typical ways. One way is you use max heart rate, which I would not recommend. Um, that means trying to find the highest heart rate you can produce, which usually means extreme motivation, almost like having a gun to your head. Go as hard as you possibly can right now uh, for a long period of time. Let's see how, how high we can get your heart rate. And it will be several minutes. It will be three to five minutes probably for this to happen on a, a really hard hill, for example, on your bike. Just going screaming hard all the way up the hill. Uh, not a good idea. The, the other way is to find your, your threshold heart rate. Uh, and use that as a reference point and then use percentages of that to set up zones. That's what I would highly recommend and you can do that. Um, my books talk about that. I think every book I've written for triathletes talks about that concept. How do you set up your heart rate zones based on threshold? So I won't go into details there. You can also go to my blog and it's joefreelsblog.com and you can search um, heart rate zones and it'll take you to a page where I talk about how to do the whole thing and it won't cost you a nickel. It's, it's basic information. So have a stop over that. And Joe's blog is awesome. It re it really is. In fact, I think we 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 uh, forwarded or shared two blog posts in just the last week. Um, so let's go sort of to the to another side of the the spectrum for somebody who's a question from somebody who's a coach, and they also say they're a 59 year old athlete. And uh, that person says, I noticed there was no comment regarding strength workouts, and wondering what your thoughts were regarding frequency of strength workouts. Uh, for more mature athletes like me, and he says his oldest, or he or she says his oldest athlete is 76. Okay. Uh, yeah, even the 76-year-old has a few years on me still. I'm, I'm gaining on that though, real rapidly. But um, yeah, strength training is, is, is very critical uh, for the for the older athlete especially. Now we can we talk about the subject of strength training. We can get into all kinds of discussions, which gets very deep after a while. Uh, let me just say this, that the older the athlete is, the more important strength training becomes. Um, I just wrote a book called Fast After 50, which devotes a great deal of, of uh, space to this whole concept that strength training is critical to, this, to, the, to the older athlete's performance. Um, and that there's research study, again, after research study that supports this, it shows that athletes can gain performance improvements at, at Older ages, 76 um, or even 50, by doing thing, by by doing strength training to prevent the loss of muscle mass, which is one of the things that happens as we age. We tend to lose muscle mass. So, and there are lots of other subtopics here. Again, you can go to my blog and you can search strength training, and you'll find all the stuff I talked about, all the categories, and the full discussion there. So it's it's a long, long discussion all by itself. Right. As I said, great blog, and, and for um, anybody who's a member of the Endurance Films Training Institute, there's certainly a, there's a whole uh, there's a myriad of, of, uh, of presentations and discussions, uh, videos about strength training for endurance sports and triathlon. Uh, you know what? It's we're I'd, I'd love to go a little bit longer. We're we're just about at that time. Uh, I want to just tell you once again that. Um, you know this this web clinic is just part of the Endurance Films Training Institute. Uh, it's not it's going to be exclusively there very shortly. So anybody who joins uh, as a yearly subscriber, it's just two hundred ninety seven dollars for a yearly subscription. You'll have access to our entire library, along with the bonus gifts from our industry partners, including a free copy of Joe's uh, the 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 power <laughs> sorry the uh, the power meter handbook. Um, I didn't know why, why I wanted to say the Power Meter Guide, but the Power Meter Handbook, and as well as an autographed copy of the Triathletes Training Bible, and that's well over a thousand dollars in value for your membership. Uh, not to mention the inherent value and just the, the content alone. Um, we'd like to thank Joe so much. First of all, I should mention our, our sponsors: uh, Training Bible Coaching and Training Peaks, both of which Joe is an integral part. 
uh, Team MPI, the Multisport Performance Institute, that's that's Mark's coaching group, Mark Sortina's coaching group, uh, Babbittville Radio, a good part, Bob Babbitt, a good uh, friend and partner of ours, and TriSports. Uh, TriSports is, is uh, offering 20% uh, off uh, to anybody who joins uh, the yearly subscription as well. That's the that's the last new part of of the offer for everybody. So, uh, Mark and Joe, thank you so much for your time. Um, we look forward to many many more, hopefully over the in the near future with both of you guys. Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Mark. Also, very well done. Yeah, thank you, Danny and Joe. It's a pleasure, and uh, I know everybody got a lot out of this, including me. So I enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you on the next presentation from the Endurance Films Training Institute.